Hi there, a uh, great opportunity for me to be able to share with you uh, as my friends from the SEND Institute have asked me to talk about relaunching decentralized churches in the long term, uh, in other words, post COVID crisis. Let me perhaps start off uh, to clarify our minds with the metaphor from the game of chess. So I'm told that if you really want to learn how to play chess, what you do is you take your queen off first. Your opponent keeps the queen and the truth is they're going to cream you for a long, long time. Uh, but what's going to happen if you don't rely on your queen is you'll learn to, uh, to understand what the other elements on the chessboard can do. And you'll master them in order to kind of try and maximize your game. And then what happens is you put your queen back in. And after that point, you'll probably be able to win at the game of chess quite consistently because you'll understand the whole system of the chessboard. I use this metaphor simply because the COVID crisis has demonstrated to us that there are severe flaws in our system and over-reliance on the queen. In our case, I think the queen largely, most contemporary or most traditional uh, views of church is that it relies overly on the kind of Sunday gathering. Um, and by over-relying on that, we have created a kind of a weakening in our capacity to understand what the other aspects of church are or to be. And I think we need to come become very much more aware of that. We can then put the queen back in later on, but without over-relying on it, because we'll understand what the other things can do. So I think it's a useful metaphor. But crisis uh, in the idea of adaptive challenge, and a crisis and adaptive challenge reveals basically two things. One is uh, adapt or die. In other words, it's a threat. There's a threat in every crisis. And there's also an opportunity, compelling opportunity. And I think both are present for us in this current crisis. The threat is, as the Queen metaphor suggested, is that we are seeing flaws or weaknesses in our system. We discovered actually we are more fragile than we ever had imagined. We'd been spent our lives building this very um, centralized understanding of the church. Uh, and now we find ourselves you know, in a more decentralized moment and we just don't know what we're doing. We don't know what the other kind of um, parts of the chessboard can do. And so that's really, it's a threat to us because until we, if, unless we're able to see our way through in the long term, uh, and the COVID crisis could go equally from 12 to 18 months you know, before we gather again in a significant manner, everything would have changed. So it's a real threat. And if you don't adapt, many, many, are, I'm, I'm afraid, are going to die. The other one is that you, uh, we see opportunity. Uh, as I heard Ed Stetzer recently say to the SEND uh, Institute gathering we were at last time, uh, that uh, we've been trying to get the church into missional mode for a long, long time. Now, missional, uh, simply the, the word missional means sent. And uh, uh, it suggested that we are uh, actually now in that mode that we've been trying to get the church in for a long time. We're actually being sent. We're like scattered. We've been dispersed. I kind of get the image. It's like the Jerusalem church in the book of Acts, right? So persecution spreads the flame of the gospel because as the people go, uh, the, the gospel spreads along the way. And I think that's a similar moment we find ourselves in. We've been sent. We've been decentralized, <laughs> whether we like it or not. Uh, another kind of metaphor very similar to this, I heard a Nigerian pastor in England uh, say this recently, that people are lamenting, oh, they, that the church is closed. You know, they're lamenting deeply that the church is closed. And he suggested, and I think rightly, that the church actually hasn't closed. I mean, it might have been Sunday gathering it's closed, but not the church, right? And he suggested that, in fact, the church has opened in a thousand other places. <laughs> the church is where everyone who is the church is at. It could be in homes, it could be in businesses, it could be where you play, education, in all the spheres and domains of society, we are the church. And actually, we might actually be open in a new way that we would not be for a long, long time. The question I think we have to grapple with at this time to see a long-term shift is, can we do we know what we're even seeing when we're seeing the church in this sent, scattered, open kind of mode? Okay. Do we even know how to recognize what we're seeing? Um, clearly we should because the book of Acts suggests that this is the standard form. But can I suggest that if, if many of us um, were able to time travel back to the period of the book of Acts or the post-apostolic church in the early centuries of the church, and we were told 
to go there with the task to go study uh, what the church is doing. If we go with our clear current understanding of the church, usually as a mega church model or whatever it is that we think about the church, uh, if we go with that in mind, we're not even going to see what God is doing in the church in the first three centuries because the church doesn't even look like that. They can't even gather. They persecuted minority. They, they don't have buildings like we, we've got them. They don't have clergy. They don't have all the stuff that we think we need to be the church. So something's going on there. I suggest most of us wouldn't have the name, the, the, the language to name what we see. And yet, friends, uh, if the irony isn't already obvious, these are the original forms. And let me also say this. They were startlingly effective. They were stunningly effective in transforming their culture. So clearly something's wrong in our mentality. And I think that uh, I think I'd like to suggest that going forward in trying to be a church uh, in 18 months plus time, um, can I suggest that you first try naming what you're seeing in the dispersed church? Can you begin to name this as church? What we now maybe call micro churches is actually a legitimate expressions of ecclesia. Uh, as, as the Bible would have it. That's what exactly what happened in the book of Acts and the riverbanks, mainly in houses, temple courts, business marketplaces, the church was all over the place. Can we also be able to name that as normative for us too? And so that is church. Maybe God's teaching us a lesson there. And then I think the question is, friends, can you organize around that to bolster it? Can you organize the church as a decentralized agency? I think we're going to have to learn those muscles very much in the next few months, or otherwise I, I think suggest we will fail. So we're learning to see and name this as normative church and organize. Then I want to suggest that you have to shift your focus. Well, I think you're being forced to, to shift focus from your alliance on Sunday gathering to a Monday to Saturday, Saturday scattering. What does the church look like scattered? during the week. And this is the church that's been there all along, but we just haven't had the language to name it. So I think it's part of this naming what we see. Then I think we need to strengthen that scattered church. Um, so start by doing a system audit, an audit, um, and be willing to let go of things that you're doing then, but they were patently ineffective, uh, and redesign it. Uh, let's be honest about it. Uh, the church prior to COVID was not fantastic. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I mean, no one's knocking the doors down to your church on Sunday morning to get in. So take a good look. Um, do a thorough reassessment and don't repeat the stuff that didn't, didn't work before. So you get a chance to kind of do that audit and, uh, and clean out, clean out shop. Secondly, I suggest that you try and embed consistent discipleship culture. Try and develop an idea of discipleship and formulate practices and embed them, discipleship practices, and bend them into every one of the micro expressions of church that you happen to organize. So that you make sure that the kind of Jesus remains central and that people are being um, taken on a journey to become more and more like him. And this you have to be deliberate about. These can be designed and there's much to be learned from disciple making movements in this regard. Perhaps number three, uh, I think as a movement, I think try and build scalability into the system and press it to multiply, to create the pressure of multiplication, which I think the gospel implies, by the way. But to build scalability, it has to be um, a sustainable size, but also multiplication size. If it's too complex to multiply by the average disciple who's a serious disciple, if they can't do it without all kind of seven years of study in seminary, then it's not scalable. So rethink scalability. Can what you do be reproduced by the, the, the average good, healthy disciple? If it, if it isn't, it's not really uh, a kind of a, a scalable movemental style of church. Finally, uh, and there's much more I can say, but I'd like to kind of suggest that you rethink uh, how ministry is organized and how it's done. We generally think of ministry as a, in terms of the pastor and teacher. That's the two orders of ministry. But I think these are insufficient uh, for a movemental and for a missional church. So Apest, uh, Apostle, Prophet, Evangelist, Shepherd, Teacher, are, is a wonderful typology in the middle of the Bible. 
in the middle of the book on ecclesiology, and Paul's best thinking about the church, we get this typology of ministry that includes the apostolic, which is an, the missional, the kind of entrepreneurial, the pioneering function, the prophetic, the kind of um, the prophet is really the prophetic function is keeping us tuned into God. It's a kind of a radar function, keeping us aligned with God and his purposes and the covenant that he engages with us. Evangelists, we think we understand a bit about, but think of it more than just a Billy Graham model or the guerrilla street evangelist, but think of evangelists as the singer of the song, the, the, uh, the person who's able to recruit others into the journey of following Jesus. Uh, and then add these, of course, to the shepherd and teacher, which we already uh, have some understanding on, have full fire, full, fully fledged fivefold types. And, and, and here's the exciting thing. They're already given to your church in the Ascension. So you don't have to invent them, um, but you can just activate them. God's already given you everything you need to be his people. Always has been there. Let's get into it. Thank you very much. <laughs>